Sorry for that. Uh, Well, friends, uh, as I said, in all the lectures this morning, what we, caref if we carefully listen to, all the speakers emphasized on how inspiring a text Gita is in great leaders' life, in scientists' life, in scholars' life, and in their own lives. And this is the secret of the Gita, that it is a source of inspiration. It's not like any other text which you can just read, close the book and forget about it. Even a single verse or perhaps even a single word of the text is enough for you to carry for the rest of your life. And that is the magnanimity of this text. We don't know why it is so, but even a single word sometimes can linger in your mind continue to think about it, you continue to inspire you to think about it. So, if you ask what is so much about Gita, as Professor Rao and many others said, it is a source of inspiration. And uh, as he said and others said, that one of the greatest leaders of this country, and not just this country, perhaps the entire international community, Mahatma Gandhi was inspired by this text. His ideals were influenced by this text. His ideals of selfless action, ahimsa, and seeking of truth was inspired by this text. So friends, what we have to keep at the outset in mind is that here is a text where you can refer to, which you can refer to, which you can consider as an eternal source of inspiration. All of you would like to be inspired, won't you be? All of you want to be inspired, isn't it? Sometimes you complain that there's no inspiration in life, isn't it? Don't we say that? There's no inspiration in life, isn't it? So all of you want to be inspired. You sometimes talk about role models whom you can look up to for inspiration, isn't it? So to begin with, here is something which can be a friend, a teacher, a philosopher, and a lifelong guide and a mentor for you. And please keep that in mind. This is not a text which can be studied for for five days or perhaps a couple of more times. But this is a text which has to be in your pocket first because you get pocket size Gita. More than that, it has to be located in your mind because Gita is not just a philosophy but it is a master key for any problem you would face in life, in your profession, in your daily life. And that is the magic of Gita. That it is, it's, 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 a, it's a master key by which you can open many, many doors and see many, many views, enjoy many, many views. So I would like to begin by saying that the speciality of the Gita is that it is an eternal source for inspiration. And we all are in need of inspiration. We all are in need of inspiration. I don't know if any one of you are thinking that, oh, I don't need any inspiration. I myself am my inspiration. No, you may be your own ins inspirer, but that's short-lived. And that's also perhaps based on your own um, identity. But you need an ins a source of inspiration, which is objective, which is deep, and which is magical. So Gita is a text which opens the world of magic in front of you. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating or I'm not even trying to hoodwink you by uh, getting your attraction to this text. I mean what I say. Now, the next question you might ask is, how can 
can I be helped and benefited by the Gita? Because as, as young people, we all are interested in better things in life, right? Why should I listen to Gita? Perhaps I have to check my status in Facebook and, uh, you know, there's so many nice things to do in life when I get some free time from the classes. But why now one more philosophical text? And perhaps philosophy is not even meant for me. So, you might say that philosophy is not even meant for me. Why should I study philosophy, right? Because there are so many difficult texts in front of you as part of your syllabus, whichever course you are doing to finish. Why one more philosophical text? Won't you ask that question? Honestly, you must be asking. Why do I need one more philosophical text? And my head is already bothered. Why should I be more bothered with those, you know, tough, tight riddles and puzzles and uh, hard-boiled uh, ideas from the Gita? You must be asking. I can see smiles in many of your faces. faces. So why should I study Gita? What, what is so important about such a philosophy that I have to, you know, spend my time to learn? And this is another speciality of this text, that it is not just deeply philosophical. It is not just deeply philosophical which can engage your brain. It is also a simple text. It is a simple text like a friend which can guide you in your daily life. And that is the beauty of the Gita. You can spend hours and hours on the etymology and the metaphysical ideas and uh, all those profound philosophical uh, concepts in the Gita. At the same time, even if you are not engaging with all those philosophical concepts, here is a text which will tell you what to do if you are faced with a challenge in daily life. It's a guiding text for your daily living. Now your next question would be, how can it guide me in my daily living, right? Because I am an angster, I am just maybe in my 20s or not even 20s, perhaps, I don't know, 18, 19, or I have just started living. And philosophy is meant for people who are perhaps plus 50, plus 60, or plus 70, or I don't know, it because, you know, when you're 18, you think old age starts from 25. So it depends upon uh, from what perspective you look at. So, so you might ask, how can it guide me? I'm just starting my life. My life is just starting. Uh, it should be a guiding text for when you are old, when we have nothing to do, and when I sit at home, you know, then perhaps that's a text. I don't think Gita can help me. I'm just a young, budding, dynamic person, you know. I, I don't have problems. Why do you say that Gita is important for me? Isn't it? Many of you would be thinking about it. Why is it important for me? Why should I learn Gita? In fact, my greatest problem now is that I have to finish these courses, I have to achieve something and I have to be excelling in, excelling in the field which I, am, uh, which I have taken up. That must be the thought in many of your minds. I'm assuming that there is no empty mind in this auditorium because that is the greatest danger. Either you have to say that this is not going to be useful to me, or you have to say, perhaps I don't know about it, but if your mind is blank, that's a danger. Because then there's no thoughts in your mind, that's not good. Because either you have to critique, or you have to support, or you have to do something. So, so that's why I want to bring this question, by shaking up your mind. Is any one of your minds empty at this time, not listening these words and not knowing what's happening? Can you raise your hand whose mind is empty? Okay, none of your mind is empty, that's great, but then, uh, you know, there's also a big philosophy which, uh, which talks about a kind of emptiness, but then we definitely won't talk about it now. 
Uh, but I'm glad to see that you all agree that you have an engaging, participating mind because that's very important. Your mind should be participating. If you are sleepy, if you are bored, if you think you have nothing to do, then it's very difficult because the, the starting point of Gita itself is a very dynamic uh, situation. So your mind should be bright, active, and so on. So if you have to take one more cup of tea from tomorrow onwards, please do that. Because in the class, we are going to have an interactive session. I won't give you an opportunity to sleep. I guarantee you that. Because you will be participating in it. You will be telling me. I'll be getting a lot of insights from you. I'll be learning from you. So we stopped by the question that, how can the Gita guide me? Maybe it's a text only for people who have reached certain age. Well, the Gita is certainly going to help you as a guiding uh, source of guidance for your daily life because none of you, whether you are young, you are 18 years old, or you are 16 years old, or you are 17, you are 20, or whatever, none of you, or none of us, can say that we are bereft of challenges in daily living, living. Because of our challenges, the greatest difficulty which we face in life, do you know what it is? The inability to see a situation in a wholesome manner. So most of the time you see part of it, perhaps 20 degree angle, perhaps 40 degree angle, perhaps 90 degree angle, but a 360 degree angle view is extremely difficult. A wholesome way in which you see the situation. I don't know what, do you, whether you understand what I mean. Whenever there is a challenging situation, you should be able to see the situation as a whole, not a part of it. Because that vision is very important. And if you don't see the wish, if you don't see a situation as a whole, what is the consequence of it? You take wrong or inadequate decisions. As many of you are managers here, and whether you are doctors or engineers or whatever you are doing, decision making is going to be very important for you, right? So the ability to take effective decisions, error-free decision is very important. We also have a challenge as youngsters that we always expect something, right? At least you're expecting that perhaps I take a break and get a coffee at 11.40 and then go to the next class, or I might even think whether I should go for the next class. So you have some expectation in your mind, right? You won't say that, oh, I just don't have any expectations. You would have an expectation. At least you would have an expectation to lift yourself from this chair because you have to leave this particular hall at some point of view. So expectation is the very fact of living. It's, it's a bodily response. So none of us are free from expectations. But then the irony is that we expect something and we get something else, right? You expect 100% marks, you get 20%. What went wrong? Or perhaps you may even expect 120%. You, get, you expect an A plus grade and you get, a, you get a whatever, B or whatever grades, right? So you expect something, but you expect, uh, get something else. And as a result of this, what happens? There's a build-up anxiety and stress. Because when you expect something and you don't get what you expect, what happens? You become anxious. And there's a built-up stress in you. And if there's a built-up stress, it's going to influence the rest of your life. Not just the rest of your life in this university, but the rest of your long life. Another challenge which all of us face in life is 
Either we have too little emotions or too much emotion. Isn't it? Sometimes you have outbursts. Somebody just smiled, but then you just turned back. You got so angry. How dare you like smile at me? I know that you, there's a secret. There's a reason for your smiling. I know you are trying to, you know, hoodwink me. You, I, I know you are like to belittle me. Same smile. Sometimes if you don't get it, again you feel upset. So there's a lot of complexity of emotions in us, in receiving it and giving it. Do I make sense what I say? So sometimes there's too much emotion. So you say that, no? Oh God, I got so too much excited about it. And sometimes yeah, I, I didn't feel like reacting to it. Maybe I should have reacted. So lack of reaction and too much reaction both can be problem. And one of the uh, I think the most important challenge in all of our daily life is a lack of purpose. Isn't it? Everything is good. The beaches are good. They are so beautiful. Monsoon has come. The class is so beautiful. The city is so beautiful. But this morning I just sit in my chair or maybe I just lie down on my bed and I think, what is the purpose of living? Where do I live? Why do I study MBBS? Why do I study MBA? What am I going to achieve? Everything is so dark. Nobody likes me. Everybody is angry with me. What am I going to achieve by all of this? At some point or other, in all of our life, we may feel a lack of purpose, an insufficiency in the goal which you are pursuing. And this is the greatest challenge in all of our lives. And it also can be the greatest danger which can badly influence us. Now, why do I say all this? Why do I say these particular challenges in daily life? I say this because here is a character, here is the protagonist of the Gita, the main character, Arjuna, who faced what we just discussed these very challenges which we just enumerated. What is his personality? Have you known Arjuna? Well, here is an extremely successful guy. He is a very intelligent, very successful, very shrewd, very strategic. He also builds strategies. And not only that, he does daredevil acts. He's not like people who will assess risk and only according to the risk will measure his action or her action and do it. No. Sometimes he just does daredevil acts. He just forget the risk element in it. He just engages in it. There are a couple of instances in Arjuna's life which are really kind of scary, which he, which he did. One was uh, his uh, journey, expedition to the Himalayas to get some very sophisticated weaponry. And the second is much more daredevil. Can you guess what it is? He enacts a woman and tries to disguise him from family and friends. That is the greatest uh, daredevil act, to even renounce your identity and take someone else, another gender identity. So here is a person who is efficient. So please remember, Gita is for already efficient people. If you think that you are not too efficient, then first be little efficient. Means be intelligent, be hardworking, be bright, be risk taking. Gita is meant for such a person. That's why, I mean, that's very another very interesting feature of the Gita. The Gita is just not just meant for a sleepy guy. Gita is meant for an already a bright person. So that is why Gita requires you to be dynamic, first of all, in your thinking. So Arjuna, as you see in the Gita, is a bright, efficient person. He is a successful guy. Now the first and the second chapter of the Gita gives, portrays Arjuna in a certain fashion. Not as a successful person. Not even as an intelligent person perhaps. If you look at the first two chapters of the Gita, Arjuna is portrayed as a sad, 
confused mind. Why? Because he at that point was the epicenter of all those challenges which we just discussed a few minutes back. And what happens to Arjuna in the main setting of the Gita? Do you know what happens to him? Do you know what happens to Arjuna at the main setting in the beginning of the Gita? Did any one of you try to look at, locate a text of the Gita before coming to this classroom? Yes or no? No? And is there an yes at all? Anywhere hidden? Do you have a text of the Gita at home? Or have you ever googled what is Gita about? And perhaps you, the first hit in Google was something else and then you forgot about Bhagavad Gita but you went to some other Gita? <laughs> well, I don't know what has happened. Anyway, uh, if you look at the first and second chapters of the Gita, the portrayal of Arjuna is very different from the actual personality of the Gita. What we first see, friends, please listen. What is very interesting is, you see a very dynamic personality otherwise. Here is this person who is completely tired. You are presented with a very dynamic personality who is otherwise. Here is a person who is completely tired. And you must be thinking, oh, he must be tired because he must have worked hard. No, he is tired doing nothing. Do you feel that sometimes? Do you? Feeling tired, doing nothing? Yeah, I thought so. We all do that. We all feel tired sometimes doing nothing. We say, I feel so tired. Why? I don't know. So here is this Arjuna. So do you, that is why it's very important for you to learn the story of Arjuna as presented in the Gita. Because here is this extremely dynamic guy, otherwise, who feels so tired and not just tired, I can give you descriptions of it because just shortage of time. You know what happens to Arjuna? His mouth gets dried up. I guess I am not saying anything which is transcendental or belongs to another world. Your mouth gets tired sometimes. My mouth gets tired, uh, dried up, I am sorry. Mouth, my mouth gets tried, dried up sometimes. When you have to lift your pen when you write your exam or when your professor asks you a question, right? You don't know. Sometimes your mouth gets dried up. Then body shivers. That's worse. Your body shivers, trumples. Right? And not only that, sometimes you have a sense of burning, intense burning of the heat. Not only because perhaps this city can get uh, extreme summers. In spite of the summer or winter, your body burns. And then you become unsteady. You're not able to stand or sit in that's why either you have to, you know, you either you have the restless leg syndrome, you keep on shaking your leg, or you poke your nose, or scratch your head, something. You cannot sit quiet in one place, because sitting quiet in one place is the beginning of any wisdom, any maturity. The ability to sit in one place quietly. If you can do that for three minutes, that's good enough for the day. So here is Arjuna who became so unsteady and you know finally what happens, not only unsteady, finally he goes into an unconscious state. I'm, I'm just making it up a little bit. He doesn't become unconscious but he be, it dizziness. His head rolls and he just falls down. And where does he fall down, do you know? Arjuna is a warrior and for a warrior, a chariot is extremely important. That is his vehicle. So he falls down onto the chariot, dropping his weapon. He forgets that weapon is always in his, you know, there's a big, there's a close proximity between Arjuna and his weapon. He drops his weapon and he collapses. Now you might ask me, what happened? Why did he collapse? What uh, forced him to collapse, right? Because unless you have such a shocking experience, why should you collapse? Friends, why Arjuna collapsed is because, again in the beginning, you would see that uh, Arjuna requests Krishna to place his chariot in the middle of two armies, Senayor, Ubhayor, Mathe, to keep 
my chariot between the two armies. So he goes into an in-between space. And why I'm stressing this in-between is because it's very important, very psychologically, very dense, and philosophically too. It's a twilight area. You know what's a twilight? Not the twilight uh, series. <laughs> the twilight area. Twilight area is where there is not enough light, but there is some light. And what happens during that time? What gets muddled? Your vision gets muddled. You're not able to see properly. So Arjuna got into a twilight space by being himself between the two armies. And again, it's very important, friends, to keep in mind that Arjuna got into a deep sense of grief by seeing or by realizing that on both sides are his friends, relatives, and family. He was kept in between his friends, family, and either way, he is going to lose them. Whether he is going to win the battle or lose the battle, this is not a win-win situation. This is a losing game. Why? Because I am going to lose my people. I might lose my friends, I might lose my family. Whichever side it is. And this is the conflicting situation Arjuna went through. And what we have to remember is, Arjuna was a good person. Only a good person can get to do that intense sorrow of losing something. I don't know how much time we have, but then it's very important to analyze what is sorrow. Uh, Professor Prasad, how much time do I have? It's almost time, I guess, right? Okay. So perhaps I can, we can discuss about sorrow tomorrow, but I, I think I may lose half the number of audience tomorrow. I don't know how, how many of you are going to turn up tomorrow. But I don't want to leave you with a note on sorrow, but I would rather leave you with something else. So, uh, keeping the sorrow part for tomorrow's discussion, let me uh, conclude what I wanted to share with you this morning with something else. Arjuna's sorrow is a very special kind of sorrow in the Gita as it is portrayed. You know why? You all become, we all become sorrowful, right? Isn't it? We all become sorrowful for various reasons. Sometimes for no reason also. Why are you sad? No, I'm just like that. I'm sad. I like to be sad. Sometimes you like to be sad because you know you want to always experiment with new, new things. So you just play with words. You don't mean anything. You just play around with words. So grief can be produced by various reasons. But Arjuna's grief, as I told you, it sprung, his intense grief sprung from his goodness of heart of having to hurt, having to cause pain to himself or to others. So his grief, first of all, is a different kind of grief. And that is the reason Arjuna's grief, finally in the Gita, elevates to a deep sense of creative expression. Arjuna's vishada, if I may use the Sanskrit word, gets into a form of yoga. And that is very important to remember that. We are not talking about a depressive grief here. A grief which has the potential to turn you into a creative thinker, an artist, or a doctor, or a manager. So what was that kind of a grief which turned Arjuna into a creative thinker? That we will see tomorrow. But please remember that. Finally, you see Arjuna as someone who gains his memory and wisdom and who is able to open up the infinite source of creative energy and creative potential in him. How did he achieve that? Who helped him achieve that? What are the secrets of turning your grief or your difficulty or your challenge into a creative space is the most exciting topic of the Gita. And uh, tomorrow I would uh, discuss a little bit more on, this, uh, on the sorrow part because that's how Gita starts with. But I would also discuss something which is very central to Gita, which is desire. What is desire? 
because you all would be having a desire now at least to have a cup of coffee or to shake up yourself from the seat which you are sitting or to leave this hall or whatever right you we all have desires what is the meaning of desire does it have any content why are our desires fluctuating what is that which we are ultimately desiring will i get all that which i desire how can i get all that which i desire i think that's more interesting question i have 101 desires how can i get all my desires fulfilled come tomorrow and know about it thank you